third speaker for, for this morning's session, uh, Professor Niederman, who is um, uh, coming from Harvard University. So let us welcome our speaker. Yes, so, um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Danny Nolman. So, so my, my background, uh, built my undergrad, my uh, PhD were in uh, soft mass matter physics. And then uh, for a postdoc, I went to a cell biology lab. Uh, and so now, like at my own lab at Harvard, we try to combine basically um, approaches from soft condensed matter physics to understand biological systems. So in particular, I've always been kind of really interested in um, self organization and basically, you know, like uh, organization of, of uh, biological structures. And that's largely what we uh, work on. Uh, in, in particular, we work on um, uh, aspects, things related to um, uh, cell division. So, uh, so I understand that most people here are physics background even though there's some, I guess, mix of engineering and, and math as well. But, but just to get a sense of like other things, so, oh yeah, another work I'm going to talk about uh, was, was done by a, a, a Jan Bruges, who's a, who's a postdoc in my lab. And so, but, but just to get a sense of, you know, where you guys are coming from, um, so this is a question, can I ask you? Is that your question? Uh, <laughs> so, so how many of you people have taken some type of uh, class on, on uh, cell biology or have any type of biology background? So like, like, you know, for example, it's like a partial test. In the title, I refer to like a metaphase spindle. And, and how many of you like have the fittest idea what I might be talking about? Oh, so that's all. Like, yes or no? Um, like, have you heard of this stuff? A or B? A or B, yes. Yeah, so A is yes. You, 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 you know something about cell biology, or you clearly have some understanding of B, you don't have You don't have to stop calling <laughs> okay, awesome. Cool, cool. And so, and so definitely, um, what is C? C? <laughs> yeah, what, what is C? <laughs> C, C, C is really have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so, so, um, no, no, okay, so that's totally cool. So, 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 uh, definitely, um, uh, feel free to like, you know, shout out and ask questions. Um, uh, you know, if there's stuff that you know I'm saying which is not clear. Um, no, so that's cool. All right, so so okay, then I'm I'm starting. You know, again, so then this may be successful. Okay, so uh, cell division is really important. Okay, so this is just the process by where you go from one cell to two cells, right? So um, this is important for like all of biology. Uh, uh, including, you know, re re reproduction, development, and growth. So, like, all of you started as, you know, your life was a single cell, and then through multiple rounds of cell division, you're as many, you know, cells as you are now, right? That's a lot of cell division. Um, and then even, like, st uh, stasis requires uh, continual cell division. So every second, there are about 10 million cells in your body which die and are replaced by cell division. So this is going on all the time. All right, so, so, um, so whenever a cell divides, right, so you all know that like, you know, you, you, know, you, you have DNA, right, your cell's a DNA, and this, you know, you know, codes for proteins, you tell them what to do. And whenever a cell divides, it's important that all the DNA, all the chromosomes, are first duplicated and then accurately segregated into the two daughter cells. So that's like a really important part of cell division. So, so every cell has a right amount of DNA. All right, so now the spindle, uh, that is the thing which is responsible for segregating the, the DNA. All right? So it normally doesn't exist in the cell, it's normally not there. But when the cell decides to divide, it, it, it uh, assembles itself, it divides the DNA, and then it disassembles. All right? So it's a transient structure. Okay? And so, um, so traditionally, like people have divided cell division into different stages based on the changing shape of, of the structure of the, of the, of the spin. Right, so first you have, okay, you know, you, you have your cell, which is ready to divide, then the spindle starts to assemble, and this is called prometaphase. Then the spindle is assembled, and this is called metaphase. And then the spindle actually segregates the chromosomes into the two daughter cells, and this segregation bit is called anaphase. Right? So most of what I'm going to be talking about is this metaphase state. Right? And so in, in many cases, this metaphase state is like a really like steady state time. So, so the cell is kind of sitting there often, you know, like you know, with the spindle, uh, and it's waiting for signals to tell it to go on. And 
And so you can really think of this as like a steady state. All right? So, so this is very kind of abstract and cartoony, but you could take you know, real movies of this happening. And here's one. So this is a spindle assembly. So that was prometaphase. Now we're in metaphase. And that's anaphase. <laughs> Second. Uh, and so, and so here, so, 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 so the green guys that I've drawn over here, uh, and I'll talk about them in a moment. These are uh, long polymers called microtubules, which are made up of a protein called tubular. All right, and biologists or, or people have developed a way to make this particular, or to make any protein that you want fluorescent. And so they make tubular fluorescent, and then they image this on a form of a microscope called a spinning disk confocal microscope. What's this tape? And so this whole structure, um, and so the spindle itself is, is of order, uh, this structure probably around, in this particular spindle is around 20 microns. And the whole movie is, will be of order, you know, an hour, and half an hour, or something like that. Okay. So that's very cool. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so this is the type of thing which you want to understand, right? And so, so for me, like, one of the things I find so fascinating is that, uh, you know, like, in some sense, right, this really looks alive, and it is alive, right? But it's just made up of molecules, which of course are not particularly alive, right? So you have a bunch of stupid molecules that get together and give you, you know, the spindle and give you life on the whole, right? So how do you kind of like go from these kind of stupid molecules to a self-organized, you know, living system which is doing something? All right. So, all right. So like I said, so so, so I mean, that was a whole process, but like you know, like now we're going to basically be focusing on metaphase. And so, in metaphase, the spindle is this kind of uh, American football-shaped structure, right? So you have all these long polymers, which are called microtubules, like I was saying before, and in the middle, that's where the DNA is, right? And um, what's going to be really important uh, for later on is that these microtubules are polar polymers, right? And this is because they're made up of little, you know, like protein subunits. Each of these subunits is a little, like, you know, polar object. And they self-assemble into essentially a crystalline lattice, which is one of these microtubules. And so one of these microtubules, so like, uh, yeah, so one of these microtubules can be microns long. And every micron you have, you know, roughly a thousand of these subunits. So it's a lot of them. A lot of the subunits are one of these polymers. And so spindles and different organisms and stuff like that are different, right? But spindles, the one I'm going to be talking about later on, they can have around 100,000 microtubules in them. All right, so that's a lot, right? So it's a lot of these polymers. Okay, so so um, for people who um, you know have like kind of like a little bit of knowledge of cell biology, or maybe like a, like high school biology, and they've seen stuff in the spindle, um, or, or actually just looking at the movie, uh, you might be tempted to think that the spindle looks thing like this. Right, that, that like, you know, that what's going on, and, and this is what, what actually, if you open up a textbook, this is typically what they show you. That, that the spindle is, you know, com composed of, again, microtubules, and that in the textbooks they tell you that all the minus end, so that, you know, these two ends, we'll call one the minus end and one the plus end, that doesn't do with electrical charge or anything, it's just a name. Um, and, and, and they tell you that, like, all the minus, you know, the, the cartoon like this implies that all the minus ends are at the poles, and all the plus ends are in the middle, and hence you have a sharp distribution of the lengths of microtubules, right? Okay, but like, um, this isn't true. <laughs> and so like, you know, like don't believe what you see in the textbooks. Um, and so, so there's kind of like aspects of this which are true in some organisms and some systems, but in many uh, organisms and systems, including what I'll, I'll be talking about more, is that the right like kind of cartoon to have in your head is thing like the following is that you have the minus and plus ends of the microtubules all over the place, right? And, and it's a very broad distribution of lengths. But the filaments are shorter than the whole structure. So, so for example, um, in the structure, which again, I'll probably, the ones that's particularly spindle, I'll be talking about more later, the whole spindle is of order 45 microns. Each filament, or, or a, 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 a fil the, the, the filaments have an average length of around 6 microns, and they're exponentially uh, distributed in length, and so broad distribution, but you know, shorter than that average length. Another thing which is a little bit misleading here is that, so like here I've drawn a black like circle around it, just to kind of, so you can kind of think of like the shape, but there's no like bounding membrane or anything like that. 
the whole structure is just these polymers kind of stuck together. Right? And so a spindle is a combination of these microtubules. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So the spindle, the spindle is just a bunch of microtubules. Yeah. Right? Um, and other proteins to kind of like stick to microtubules and cross link them and, and move them around and control how they grow and shrink. Okay? And so then the question is somehow you have basically, you know, like these polymers, you know, get, work together to give you the spindle. So how does that work? Right? How, how can we think about that? And another thing uh, that's very important to realize is that all these polymers are incredibly dynamic. So these structures of spindle can exist at steady state for hours. So you can sit in metaphase for hours, and you just like sit there and hold a spindle, and it's just sitting there, and you walk away from the microscope, you come back, it's still sitting there, it's just like, it looks like, oh, there's the same spindle. But all of these 100,000 polymers are all constantly moving and growing and shrinking. So here we have a movie. Uh, this is a spindle. There's one pole here, one pole here. The, the DNA is in the middle. And each dot is a single molecule of tubulin that's, you know, fluorescently labeled. All right? So here we have only a, one in 100,000 of these molecules labeled, so you can see individual molecules. And you only see the molecules if they're incorporated in the microtubule in the spindle. And what you see is that every single one of these is moving. Right, so you have these 100,000 filaments, which are all constantly sliding relative to each other, and also constantly growing and shrinking, yet you still have a steady state structure that exists for hours. In fact, the time scale of this growing and shrinking of individual microtubules is of order 20 seconds. So any given one of these 100,000 polymers only lasts for about 20 seconds. So, you know, basically it's nucleated, right, grows and, and shrinks and vanishes, and it's gone. Right, but somehow you're always making new ones, and, and you get a steady state structure. And it's not just these polymers, which are always growing and shrinking, uh, and binding and unbinding to the structure, but essentially every other protein, you know, there, all these cross-linkers are always, you know, very dynamic as well. So it's a super dynamic, you know, structure. But steady state, steady state. So on large length scales, it's not changing. Do we know the reason why it does that? Uh, so that's a really uh, interesting question. So I can hypothesize. I mean, so the, the short answer is no. But, <laughs> but 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 the long answer is, is that so, so what I would guess is that um, so you know it's very important for the chromosomes to be divided accurately. And so I can imagine that as this thing is assembling, it's kind of hard for a chromosome to kind of get in the right place. And maybe all this turnover dynamics. You know, it makes the structure kind of more fluid in some sense that allows you to like you know, correct errors and stuff like that. Alright. So another thing which just illustrates the amazing like, I don't know, ability attributes of the spindle is the experimental system we use. Right? Okay. So this is we didn't develop this, other people developed this. Um, but what we do is that so we take a frog, we inject it with a hormone that makes it lay a bunch of eggs. Alright? So, actually it's interesting, so, 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 so the hormone that you inject this in the frog with comes from the, uh, originally came from the urine of uh, pregnant women. <laughs> and, and apparently this was actually used as a, um, a pregnancy test. Um, um, it used to be used as a pregnancy test. These frogs, women or men? A woman, a woman, a woman. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and you could, like if you inject this, I mean, actually, the same compound you inject the frogs with, like, like um, in, in, in vitro fertilization, in, in clinics where uh, people are having problems, you know, um, uh, uh, giving birth and they want to have birth, right? Then, then you can inject humans with the same compound to, to try to, you know, uh, in, in, increase fertility. But, but, but every time I like mention that, right? I always wonder, like, who was the first person to like figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell are they doing? But, like, I, I've never looked at that. But, anyways. Um, and so, so you check with this compound, and make some lay a lot of eggs. Um, and each one of these eggs has a little spindle in it. So it's arrested in metaphase, and it's waiting to get fertilized by a sperm where a plant will go on. Right? Okay, but it's still like arrested in metaphase, so each guy has a little spindle in it. Right? Then you take a bunch of these uh, uh, eggs, you put them in a centrifuge tube, and you spin, and you spin very gently, and you crush the eggs, and all the big stuff goes to the bottom, and, and all the very, very small stuff goes to the top, 
but it's very gentle. So essentially, in the middle, you basically have everything on the inside of the egg. So you have the whole like cytoplasm there, all like the goop in the side of the cell. But when you've done this, you've actually gotten rid of the DNA. And so, biochemically, it's in metaphase, but there's no spindle there. Now, if you just, so if you take this stuff, and you add DNA to it, it will assemble a spindle that, as far as anyone can tell, is just like the spindle in the, in the uh, up front. And in fact, it doesn't matter what sequence of DNA you add. So people can take magnetic beads, code it with, like, I mean, basically any DNA that you can think of, so DNA from a virus or something like that, and still, it will assemble a spindle that has the same you know, morphology and the same dynamics as in the, in the frog. And so, and so some kind of like all the components are there in this extract, but they need the DNA to kind of like, you know, get things started, and then the whole structure just self-organizes. Alright? And it's really like a steady state structure that's stable against perturbations. Right? So what you can do, for example, so in this abstract system, right, you have a little like, you have all these spindles floating around, you can go with glass needles, for example, and just cut off one of the poles and throw it away. And then over time, it'll grow back. So it kind of like heals itself. Uh, and it's also stable to like biochemical perturbations. So normally, the spindle is this bipolar structure, and then you can add, you know, you can like perturb a specific molecule which makes a change from a bipolar structure to a monopolar uh, aspect. And so actually, like, the, the compound that does that is actually, it's a drug which influences, such as you know, I showed you all the sliding before. So it's thought that the sliding is driven by little motors that take anti microtubules, cross them them, and push them apart. If you add a compound that screws up that motor, you undergo this transition here. And actually, like, the compound which does, this is, a, this is a different steady state structure. And if you remove the inhibition, you can go back. So you can transition to different steady state structures. Yeah? So do they always make a tectoid density? Now it's And so that's some question. So, 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 so different um, spindles and different organisms are, are different. So sometimes they have this kind of tectoid shape. Sometimes they're nearly spherical. Um, and other times they're very almost diamond like. Oh, and I should say, oh yeah. And so actually, for example, it's, it's interesting. So the compound, uh, or one of the compounds that does this, um, was actually like in clinical trials as like an anti cancer uh, compound. So because the whole idea is that, uh, you know, like cancer is the uncontrolled proliferation of cells. So if you can have like a compound that screws up dividing cells, maybe you can help like kill cancer. And actually, you know, like, if they do this on, like, you know, like, so they, you know, they have model systems where they, like, have a mouse and they give it cancer, and then they throw this drug on, and if you look inside the mouse, you see little spindles, you know, kind of like this, and stuff like that. So it's really, potentially medically relevant. But also the good cells, right? Yeah, also the good cells, mm -hmm. which is, which is exactly, exactly. So, like, chemotherapy has all <laughs> these awful, awful side effects, and it's because most chemotherapies work by, like, doing stuff like screwing up a spindle, as you can imagine, you know, that would not be good. Um, um, okay. okay, so then the take home message uh, for what I'm saying so far is as follows. And that is that, like, so like I said, so I'm from the soft matter physics background, as, as many of you guys are. And on one hand, it's tempting to think about assembly of a structure like this in terms of some type of like self organizing, you know, like principles or something like that, like we're used to in soft and matter physics, right? But on the other hand, it's very important to realize that this is fundamentally different than. You know, assembly of like you know, you know, amphiphiles or block polymers or something like that, because, like you know, if you have a bunch of amphiphiles, okay, those will self-assemble to some you know structure because like, they're trying to basically minimize some free energy, right? The spindle is uh, sometimes a self-organized structure, but the organization you get has nothing to do with minimizing free energy because it's highly non-equilibrium. So all these little motors, you know, pushing stuff and. The, the films are growing and shrinking, and all those activities require that they use the input of energy. All right, and so and so it's, it's quite different. But so then, the question, or one of the questions we have, which is what I'll talk about now, is the following: So, so okay, spindles aren't insanely complicated. 
So like, you know, like, so we know that there are hundreds of different proteins that are important for like these, pro these processes, right? And we certainly don't understand all these different molecules that are, you know, important for, for making this stuff happen. But the question is, despite that, can we actually say something, you know, like solid about, about what's going on? Can we have some kind of quantitative, you know, like understanding of phenomenology? And what I mean by that is, you know, for example, you know, you might care about, well, what determines like the size of the spindle or, 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 or what gives rise to its shape, right? Or, you know, I mean, how does the chromosomes get to the middle? Or, you know, like what determines the dynamics of this response to perturbations? And clearly it seems, at least for me, kind of crazy to think that you have to understand all of these hundreds of components or, you know, the exact position of all, you know, 100,000 microtubules to understand this, right? Um, so then the question is, can we get some kind of, quanti you know, quantitative phenomenology of these things? Right? And so, and so, I mean, one way one might imagine doing that is trying to ask, is it possible to have some kind of continuum theory of the spindle, right? Just like one uses continuum theories to understand, you know, again, regular liquid crystals, should one, you know, can one use a similar approach to think about the spindle, right? So, so what a lot of people have done, uh, there are a number of groups have done the following, is that they've said, okay, so like, you know, so, so on one hand, these cytoskeletal, you know, structures like the spindle seem a lot like liquid crystals, right? Some like birefringent thing, a bunch of aligned, you know, molecules. But on the other hand, like I said, it's highly non-equilibrium. So then a number of groups have asked, you know, from a theoretical perspective, if you take these kind of standard theories that people are used to in liquid crystal physics, can you somehow tweak them to account for the non-equilibrium behavior due to the presence of these motors and the equilibrization and the equilibrization and stuff like that? Right, and so, and so many people have developed theories like based around you know that idea, and this is these are generally called active liquid crystal theories, and so they're basically extensions of the uh, standard liquid crystal theories, which you know like you guys you know are either familiar with or will be very familiar with, you know when you guys are done with this uh, 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 summer school. Right, some of the questions yes, yeah, so, so, so yeah, and so on one hand you might be like, oh of course this stuff is going to work to describe the spindle because. These theories, just like regular liquid crystal theories, are, are based on really incredibly general arguments about you know, symmetries and conservation laws and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you know, just because you make general arguments, it doesn't mean they're actually correct for any specific system. Um, and and one can think of many, many reasons. You know, like I said, these are insanely complicated systems. You know, like uh, they're you know, okay, 100,000 microtubules. That's a lot of microtubules, but it's not you know, 10 to the 23rd, right? And so you, one could worry about like you know, continuum theories breaking down and. You Plane scales, etc. So then the question is, I mean, how can we know, right? Okay, so like you know, like I'm I'm, I'm, I'm an experimentalist, you know, I love to experiment a lot. What experiments can we do to tell if these type of frameworks are appropriate for for thinking about the spindle? Okay, so so just to kind of like I don't know, start like being in the right framework. Right, so, so, so like what like might these continuing theories like look like kind of, right? So there are many different versions of them, right? And you can imagine different things, but like, okay, so the idea is that we have this spindle here, and, and you know, if you think about some like little like chunk of spindle material, it's made up of a bunch of microtubules, right? So you might imagine that the uh, density of microtubules is going to be important. That's going to be some field in your like continuing theory, right? I, I said microtubules are polar polymers, that means that, so these guys have little arrows associated with them, that means in this little region of space, you have some average polarity, right? So you might think that like, you know, the polarity of microtubules, that might be some other field that you would like care about. And I mentioned before that there are all these little motors here, but these motors are gonna push on things and, you know, generate stresses. So you might have some like stress tensor that you're gonna care about. And so like, it's reasonable to say that maybe these are the relevant fields in some continuum theory of the spindle. But what if you imagine, you know, you know, other things. And I said, you know, again, the question is, how can we tell? Are these really the right fields that we should, like, be caring about? And also, you know, like, given that these are the right fields, again, like, one can imagine many different types of theories that one could construct with, you know, these things, and, and, and so, which one's right? So, experimentally, how can we have All right, so, so, all right, so, how, are you guys familiar with correlation functions? The idea of, like, measuring or calculating correlation functions? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, so now we can go. Correlation functions.
talk to you about this argument that like why correlation functions are kind of good things to like measure and think about. Okay? And, 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 then, and then I'll kind of go on a little more about what we actually do. Alright, so then like so let's pretend that you have some like continuum theory that you're like interested in like testing, right? So like probably at some point all you've actually seen the diffusion equation, right? And like, you know, and so you're thinking about the diffusion equation, right? This is a continuum theory, which tells you maybe how like dye spreads in, in, in water or something like that, right? But let's say you were really skeptical, right? So like you learned in school that that like the continuum that, 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 that this continuum theory is a good description of dye spreading, but maybe you're like, I don't you know, like I, I don't believe it, right? I mean, so how could you go and test if it was good or not, right? So um, one thing you can imagine doing, you could say, okay, I'm going to go to lab, I'm going to drop some dye in a beaker, and I'm going to watch how it spreads, and I'm going to see if this like way it spreads, um, you know, like follows this equation, right? So if I measure the density every time, and I see how it evolves, then this is true, right? So experimentally, that's actually like incredibly hard to do. Right, because the way this spreads is going to depend on exactly how you dropped it in, and like you know, like you know, what the boundary conditions are, and all these details, which is really hard to you know control properly when you're doing an experiment. Right. So then you can imagine another thing, right? You could say, right, maybe what you do, and again, this is an example. This is just an abstract example that has nothing to do with this right? This sort of on the same page. Um, what you could do if you want to test this theory is this thing else. You could wait till you're at steady state. And then look at small fluctuations, you know, like around steady state. And so this idea is, is that if I think of the density here as some like constant plus some small fluctuations, those small fluctuations will also obey the diffusion equation. Okay? So that's just this is like semi promising maybe, but it's still not like very good from an experimental point of view, because by definition, the fluctuations on average are zero, and it's hard to measure something which is zero. Right? So, but it ends out that the correlation function of the fluctuations also obey the diffusion equation. Right? And so that's something that you can measure, right? So it's literally like saying, like, you know, like how are fluctuations at one point in time and space correlated with fluctuations at some other time and uh, you know, point in uh, time and space, right? This is thing you can experimentally measure. Right? And so, for example, in the case of diffusion, right, you could look around at some sample and you could say, all right, so like at equal time, how does the fluctuations, you know, vary in space, right? And if if things are going by diffusion, nothing's interacting with each other. So things at one point in space don't know about things at another point in space. So stuff is kind of like white noise. And therefore, if you look at stuff as a function of wavelength, for example, it would be flat or, or, or a wave vector. But then, if you look at things at, let's say, you know, equal, um, you know, two, you know, equal points in space and how things, you know, vary over time, then stuff would vary, right, because things are fluctuating around. And the way that that stuff varies has to do with, you know, basically, you know, you could calculate that from the theory and see if the way stuff varies actually agrees with the theory, right, so it's a test of the theory. And then, you know, like, if you find agreement, you could, like, you know, by fitting the way stuff decays to, to the parameter of theory, in this case the diffusion equation, you can measure the diffusion, uh, I'm sorry, in this case the diffusion constant, you can measure the diffusion constant. And this is basically the basis for many experimental techniques that people use, such as dynamic light scattering and fluorescent correlation spectroscopy and other things. Right? So, what, what the basic take home message is that, you know, correlation functions is a thing you can experimentally me measure, and it's intimately related with essentially the equations of motion of the theory. So then it suggests that one, you know, one thing one can do is that one could actually, you know, like experimentally measure the spatial temporal correlation functions of all of, you know, of the relevant fields in, in the spindle and see if they agree with them theory or not. Right? And, and so, you know, we can measure these different fluctuations with different types of um, techniques. And so we can measure density fluctuations in the spindle with fluorescence microscopy. We can measure orientational fluctuations, so fluctuations in the director with quantitative polarized light microscopy. And we can measure stress fluctuations with microbiology. And the idea is that we're going to do all this and then we're going to you know, see if they agree with the prediction from the you know, sort of the theory. Okay, so, so first I'll talk about orientational fluctuations. 
So here we use like a really amazing instrument called the LC Polescope, which was invented by Rudolf Oldenburg at uh, Woods Hole. And in this, uh, with this instrument, in one shot, you get two pieces of information, two like pictures. One, uh, at every kind of pixel in an image, you, you get a measure of the retardance. So the retardance is the birefringence integrated over some optical volume. So you have a quantitative measurement of that at every pixel. And then two, at every pixel, you have a quantitative measure of the uh, uh, slow angle. And so basically, of the pneumatic, you know, like of the angle that the director is, is oriented at. Okay, so this is just like, you know, whatever it's got to come into. The retardance images by putting a lambda page. How is this done in practice? Uh, no, I, don't, I mean the retardance image by putting a lambda page. Oh, I'm sorry, can you say it, please? I mean, how do you measure the retardance image? Yeah. So, 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 so the way this is done is, 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 is so this was this technique invented by Rudolf Oldenburg. So you might imagine that okay, naively one way that you can imagine getting this information, this is not how this is done, but just conceptually in your head, is by having cross polarizers and rotating them and taking different images and then kind of building this information up. Right? So in practice, that's, very, that's not a good thing to do because it's very hard to accurately rotate these guys, you know, like relative, you know, as well people have the same orientation, right? So what Rudolf does instead is that he uses a, um, a circular analyzer and then uses a liquid crystal device to send them light at different ellipticities. And so then because everything's liquid crystal, you know, based, is there no moving parts or anything like that? And he can, you know, like basically very reproducibly and very accurately send them light with, you know, control ellipticities and, you know, vary those and then reconstruct this information after doing some corrections. But that's the gist of it. Okay, so this is kind of a one snapshot, but then you can take movies. So this is a five minute movie of a spindle uh, on a loop, and, and this is one of these like retardance images, right, or movies, right? But what you can see here is this like shimmering. So this shimmering was first observed by Shin Inoue, who called it the uh, uh, Northern Lights. So the shimmering event. All right. So the basic like thing is that we're going to analyze this type of shimmering and like you know see what we can learn from it. So the retardance um, uh, images are uh, well in theory they could be a little more or they, it's a little bit more complicated. So I'm not going to talk about that first. First, I want to talk about the, the, the orientational fluctuation. And so this is really like, you know, director fluctuations, right? But I'm not going to show you a movie of that because it, it doesn't look as cool. Right. But, but that is the same. So you take a movie, right? At every pixel, right, you have a, some certain average orientation, right? And then it's, you have fluctuations around that average. And you're looking at spatial temporal correlation function of those fluctuations. Right. So, and now I'm going to first show you the, the correlation of those fluctuations in the perpendicular direction uh, for equal time as a function of wave vector. All right. So this is data for how many, like eight different spindles, something like that. And you can see it decays like one over k squared. Right. So for people who aren't used to thinking about that, what that means, that means that like, so fluctuations like this are small, so this is like a, this is a high K, you know, high K is, you know, you don't have a lot going on there, right, you know, small, this is small, this is okay, right, so, you know, like, so, so you're allowed to do like a fluctuation on some long wavelength, right, or small K, but like high, you know, high wavelength, or, or like a large K is strongly suppressed, right? And it's suppressed in a fashion that, 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 that you know, changes with uh, 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 wave vector, like one over K squared, right? So right away, like I was saying, so you can say that, okay, this, this couldn't be the case if microtools are not interacting with each other, so you can reject that model, which would be like a really stupid model to have in the first place, but still you can reject it. And it's interesting to note that this one over K squared Director fluctuations, you actually, th these are the same fluctuations you actually get in, in regular, you know, honest to goodness, like the magnetic crystals, like, like, you know, like, yeah, an equilibrium the magnetic 
superficial also gives you one of your case variant fluctuations. And in fact, these non these active uh, uh, liquid crystals, if you look at the theories people wrote down, those will also give you one over k squared. Right? And so the reason for that, the reason that, that, that kind of both active and passive give you one over k squared is as follows, is that you can say like, well, no, you say that that suggests that kind of like the you know like a, a dynamics for the director of you know the change of director goes like some constant times del squared n. So what I mean by that is as follows. I mean that like if, if you just literally said if you had, if, if this equation was like true, right? So like God like tells you this is correct, right? Plus, well, it's not actually, the, 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 here there, there are no fluctuations, right? There's not some the theory. But if you have this plus some, some noise term, right? So this first term over here, this is, you know, so, so the, the change in n in front of time equals k times del squared n. This is, K here is some kind of orientational elasticity, right? That's saying the guys want to line up. You know, if you go like this, they want to relax, right? That's, that's this term here. And then this is some noise term. This is just some fluctuating Gaussian uh, uh, like noise. And if this is correct, if this was like the true theory, you can calculate this correlation function, and you would get 1 over k squared, right? And, and this k squared basically comes from this, you know, you know square right there, all right? And the, the coefficient out in front, it's, it's, it has to do with the variance of this term here and the, the, the ratio of this variance to the orientational elasticity. So in equilibrium, this F squared has to do with thermal energy, right? And therefore, by measuring these fluctuations, because you know what KT is, what thermal energy is, you can measure the orientational elasticity of like real liquid crystals. You try the first equation from the Fourier you know? Second? The first equation. How you try it? How do you drive this equation? Well, and so, and so, and so, I mean, so, so like, so, like, the complete theory you can imagine having other terms, but in some sense, this is like the simplest thing that you could have imagined. So, like, you know, like, if one just kind of just writes down, like, the simplest thing possible, like, this is it. Basis of the Cauchy theory for continuing and Um. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, but this is really like the simplest thing that one could possibly imagine, basically. You know what I mean? So this is like, is that? I mean, like, in this, in this is, right, so I mean, yeah, this is a simple one. Right? But so, like, if this was true, then this would be true. And so, like, if you really believe this theory, then, then what you could do is that you could say, all right, so your theory predicts this 1 over k squared, but then the amplitude has to do with this kind of the ratio of these two parameters. So by fitting your data to this line, we could you know, essentially measure the ratio of those two parameters if you believe your theory. Right? And so for example, here is actual data, you know, like averaged, you know, for different spindles, you know, fit to this one over k squared. And you see that we could agree with it. Alright. So now so that, now, now now this is kind of um, so I don't want to say that, okay, so this is, this is a, an argument that these type of continuum theories, right, aren't necessarily wrong, right? So it's not necessarily an argument yet that they're right, but it's like, you know, okay, like it's kind of seeming reasonable, right? Because you have some prediction of how stuff should behave and it's behaving, right? So, so the first question is, does this make sense? Do people have like some idea of what the point of trying to make? <laughs> you can say no, it's also that I'm just, I just want to know, like, am I getting like the, the gist of the argument across, right? Because this is what going to be like. But this essentially is the argument. <laughs> okay. In this model, they are in the line of No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, okay, okay. So, so then I'll, I'll just explain. So some people seem to get it, some people don't. But don't so much. And so then I'll, I'll just kind of like. Um, Okay, so then maybe I'll just kind of go back one more time. And so, and so then really, like, so, so the point is as well, so you could say that, like, okay, so you have a bunch of guys, you know, who are lined up like this. It's okay. Well, so first I'll just say this question about thermal equilibrium or not. And so if there was someone, if this fluctuation was related to, to thermal fluctuations, then this would be equilibrium. But in general, this is not. Right? So, so in general, this is just some non-equilibrium noise that maybe has to do with how these motors are binding and unbinding, or like, you know, like how they're orienting filaments or something like that. But, but essentially, like, 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 you know, like what the heart of the argument is, is that you have this stuff that's wiggling around, right? And the way, like if you think about these type of theories, the way that the, the wiggle happens,
back and it has to do with like how you're kicking it, right? And how it responds to the kick, right? So then seeing you know how these fluctuations like occur, you can learn about like the underlying theory, right? And again, this is like people, you know, this is the same type of logic is used in like you know, real equilibrium, you know, like uh, liquid crystals all the time. Right? And so again, so it's like you know, like you measure, you know, like so like if you want to measure, well, if you want to measure less, you know, orientational elasticity of a real liquid crystal, you could do it by looking at direct fluctuations. Or if you have some like smectic liquid crystal and you want to understand, you know, like properties of, you know, again, like how the smectic layers fluctuate, you can do some x-ray scattering experiment and measure density density correlation functions. And by looking at how those you know behave, you, you, you could learn about the elasticity of, of your smectic liquid crystal. Okay. All right. Okay, so then so then is that okay, so then we kind of push this farther. Okay, so that was kind of orientational fluctuations. What about density fluctuations? All right, so then what we do is that we do, um, you know, fluorescence. So, so we fortunately label these molecules tubule, which make up these polymer microtubules, and then we take movies. So this is one 2D plane of a movie, but we actually have three three dimensional information. All right, and then again, we so we take movies like this, and then we're going to measure like fluctuations of this, right? So that what we're talking about before was orientational fluctuations. Now we're talking about density fluctuations. All right. It ends up that the retardant fluctuations I was showing you before, this birefringent fluctuations, give you the exact same answer. Like if you measure the, 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 the retardant fluctuations, they're exactly the same as the fluorescent fluctuations. And this argues that the fluctuations in retardants are due to fluctuations in concentration. Which makes a lot of sense because we know that these polymers, the microtubules in the center, are highly, highly aligned. And so it's all kind of Right. So, all right. So now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to, uh, at equal time, we're going to look at how density fluctuations are correlated in the direction perpendicular to the spindle. All right. So, so kind of like, what would you expect? So, you might expect that kind of. So, the, the kind of the stupidest like theory you could write down for the density is you could say the density is diffusing, right? So, so this is just like diffusion we had before. Um, I mean, it's a little small. Yeah. Is diffusing, right? I mean, of course, this is some generalized diffusion in the sense it's just kind of like <coughs> moving in some random way. But now, remember, these guys are polar and they're active. So, for example, guys could, like, you know, uh, move, you know, based on how they're pointing. Right? So, for example, you know, in the information process, you have a polymer, imagine one of these microtubules here, it grows at one end and shrinks at the other end. It's like the polymer moves. Right, so that's kind of density affecting. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, 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 that's kind of like polarity that's affecting uh, density. Right. This is a non-equilibrium thing, but this is kind of like the, the, the simplest thing one might imagine. All right. Well, so there would have to be. There would have to be to have this type of thing. There would have to be. Because here, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're saying that stuff is running around. We're saying that guys are like, you know, actually moving somewhere, right? So there must be. I mean, it's not like explicitly like shown here, but but, but there must be some some energy in the bottom line, yeah, in order for this to be correct. Second. Well, so here I mean, I'm talking about experiments. And so by diffusion length, do you mean the diffusion coefficient? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to measure. That's what we're trying to measure. I mean, so like, when you said, you know, like a diffusion coefficient, you're saying that you have some term in your equation for density that goes like del squared c. Like, if you don't have that, and you really don't, I mean, the idea of a diffusion coefficient is not kind of, you know, it's kind of like only well-defined terms of the theory. So that's what we want to measure. We want to measure that, exactly. So in some sense, this is all like a way of measuring those types of things. All right? But, 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 but this is like a hypothesis that this equation is, you know, it's a possible, you know, maybe it's correct, maybe it's not, right? So, so if you have these large orientational fluctuations like we were talking about, and you have this kind of simplest theory that you can imagine, this predicts that density fluctuations should also go like 1 over k squared. And this is something people call large number fluctuations. And the reason that they give it a name is because it's really weird. Right? And so the reason it's weird for density fluctuations to go like 1 over k squared, this says that as you go to larger and larger length scales, 
you have larger and larger fluctuations. Right? If that were true, in some sense, you don't even have a well-defined density. So that's an incredibly bizarre prediction, but it comes right out of these type of theories. So the question is, like, experimentally, do we see that or not? Right? And the answer is we don't. Okay. So, <laughs> so, 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 like, it's clearly not. Uh, and so the simplest thing that we can write down is, is clearly wrong. So when we measure density correlation functions, we see that they're flat at large length scales, and then they go like one over k four at, at, at uh, you know like for, 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 for large k. So this simplest theory that we can imagine is clearly wrong, right? And so here we do have a well-defined density. We can just fiddle. So 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 we're missing something, and the question is, what are we missing? All right, so, 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 so Jan thought about this a bunch, and then he realized that, like, one thing, this simple thing, so simple theory you brought down is obviously wrong in one way. And that is, I was telling you before, that microtubules are growing and shrinking all the time. Right? Well, here we're saying the density of filaments is conserved. Right? So obviously that's, I mean, that's not right. So you could say, like, in general, you would have, in fact, this isn't conserved. You have some kind of, like, source and sink terms. That could be a function of space, a function of concentration, a, a function of you know, you know, the way things are pointing. Whatever. In general, you might expect that the simplest thing you could imagine is that in the spindle, you know, filaments are appearing at some rate and then vanishing at some rate, which is kind of the simplest thing you could think of. Right? So then now, okay, so you can add this to this theory and then say, like, okay, now what do you predict for, for density correlation? And you can calculate that. And in fact, it, it, it agrees very well with, with the experiments. And so what happens here is that adding turnover destroys these so-called large number fluctuations. Right? And so I'll explain that. Okay, so, so what's going on physically is as follows. Is that so all right, if you imagine that density is conserved and these guys are like you know moving around and you're getting huge fluctuations because of that. To move a large distance, I had to go on a large length scale, it takes a lot of time. Right? The larger you know, distance you're trying to move, the longer time that takes. But if filaments are turning over at some rate, at large length scales, turnover always wins. Because turnover is just at some rate. And so larger length scales, turnover is always happening more rapidly than stuff can move. And so that kills these like large dense, these large length scale density. Right? And then, so in theory, you get a, a, a regime where things are flat. It could go to 1 over k squared, like in the regular theory, and then 1 over k4. And, 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 um, and you either see that 1 over k squared regime or not, depending on parameters. And so if we sit and in this length scale, you get going from flat to not flat, has something to do with the ratio of this bending elasticity and this turnover. Therefore, by you know looking at that that uh, you know curve, you, you can in some sense get an estimate of, of the ratio of those two. All right. So, right. So then the picture here, if you believe this uh, and stuff, is that just to say again, is that so now we have these large orientational fluctuations that are driving these density fluctuations. And the density fluctuations are relaxing as they are because of, and so, so essentially, even in the regular theory, you, you transition from 1 over k squared to 1 over k4 because of, of this term here. This gives you the, 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 the k4 bit. Or, or the combination of that and that. And so this is basically saying that in this type of theory that we have these orientational fluctuations driving density fluctuations. All right, so then one can test that that's really true by asking how do these two fluctuate together? Right, again, so just kind of using the same argument again and again. And that we can do experimentally. So I mentioned before that retardance fluctuations are the same as fluorescent fluctuations, i.e. they're both measuring density fluctuations. So what one can do is that, using this you know, LC pulse scope, one can simultaneously measure the orientation at a location and the density at a location and do the cross correlation of those two, and then what one sees agrees with um, uh, 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 experiments. All right. So this confirms this picture 
of you know like large uh, uh, you know the coupling between orientational fluctuations and density fluctuations as as you kind of like have in this view. And then once more kind of like you know just continuing all like the same type of logic. Now when you measure stress fluctuations, so you would be like okay how can you measure stress fluctuations? It's not obvious. All right, so 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 the logic. Um, is as follows. And so basically, there, there, there are many like slightly different ways of doing this, but they're all based around the same ideas. And this is to just get from other people, or these were ideas from other people. But the logic is as follows: is that all right? So like, if you measure, okay, imagine you have some equilibrium system, and you have some particles in it. You could measure the correlated fluctuation of those particles, right? This is what people call like passive microbiology, and if you know that it's driven by thermal fluctuations, you measure the correlated motion between these guys. Right? You know, these guys are talking to each other through stress fluctuations in the, in the media. So if you know that it's kind of driven by, um, um, I don't know, they're talking to each other through the media. And so if you know fundamentally it's driven by thermal fluctuations, then you can figure out some mechanics of the media. So this is what people call microbiology. Right? So here we're not in equilibrium, so we can't do that. But we can say in general, though, if we actually measure the mechanical properties, which, which uh, people have done, measure the mechanical properties of these spindles by taking calibrated glass needles, sticking them in the spindles, and wiggling them around, so you can directly, so you can you know, measure mechanical properties of the spindle, and then you can measure the correlated motion between two guys, and you can say, all right, like if you know, in these simple continuum theories, the same, same relationship should hold, then you can infer what the stress fluctuations might, must have been. So by combining this passive measurement and an active measurement, you infer stress fluctuations. So it's going to Okay. And so, how are we doing time? Just uh, run out of time, so maybe one more minute. Okay, okay, okay. So then, so then, all right. So whatever you can do it, you know, like in these theories, you kind of predict a certain form of stress fluctuations in general. Then, then you can measure that, and you get the with experiment. And everyone can see that these stress structures are, are non-thermal, so, so they're clearly violent fluctuations of the patient. So I'll just kind of very briefly go to the end and say that one can argue that like um, this all you know suggests that these type of theories are appropriate. There's a natural generalization of them, which looks very complicated. <laughs> one can kind of just do it and just say, like, given all our measurements, this is the kind of simple theory that you can write down. With that, you can simultaneously fit uh, with that more complicated theory all of the measured correlation functions as a function of both wavelength uh, uh, and space uh, uh, and frequency. So that's kind of eight different functions you can fit with just six parameters, which is quite impressive because you know even if these were power laws, you would need 16 parameters just to you know empirically classify them, but you can do it with six. Um, and therefore you can measure all these parameters, which is the diffusion coefficient that was asked about previously, uh, and it's highly constrained. Um, and these, some of these make sense based on other measurements, like the turnover that we get from here. And then just very briefly, I'll say, so this is a strong justification that this type of theory is correct. Now you can use that theory to calculate things like the shape of the spindle. And so I'll just show this very briefly, that like you can do stuff like, you know, you have to make a lot of assumptions, but you can argue the spindle, um, you know, you can, um, but then you can argue the spindle is an ellipse, and it is. And so there's a thing I'll end on, that in this type of theory, you can, you know, you say, okay, if the spindle is an ellipse, which it is, you can measure the orientation of microtubules everywhere inside the spindle, right? So this is experimental measured everywhere. This is theory, the orientation everywhere. And you can see quantitative agreement at, at you know, everywhere. The thing which is so impressive about this, though, is that this agreement involves actually no parameters at all. And so the reason is, it's not, it's not that this doesn't involve, you know, like, you know, like, it's not just the parameters we measure, it's literally no parameters at all. Because if in the spindle, you know, one can argue that the only thing which matters to determine the orientation of microtubules is bending elasticity, and one can argue that that's correct, then the value of the bending elasticity is irrelevant. So this is the prediction for the orientation uh, of microtubules, just given that you have know, defects at the poles and that they want to be tangential to the surface. In other words, this is just the solution to the equation del squared theta equals zero. Which one natural gets from this type of theory, and you still see quantum agreement with the experiment. Which I think is pretty amazing. Um, and so, just in very brief, so these incredibly complicated biological systems, 
can be, I would argue, very quantitatively described by these quite simple theories. Uh, essentially, all the parameters of the theories can be measured, um, uh, nearly all the parameters, and uh, one can use the, to understand uh, morphology. That's kind of, but there's a lot more to do. <laughs> okay. It was a wonderful lecture. Unfortunately, we don't have much time for, uh, for questions. Um, uh, as we will have our next speaker uh, setting up the computer, maybe one quick question, if there is one. Yes. So, in your session, have you ever observed some non bike class structure, such as a lady or a and yeah, So, if you perturb things, so in, the, in the regular system that never occurs kind of spontaneously, if you screw up different um, if you screw up different kind of like motors and, and other things, you can get those shapes to change to happen. And so, what the idea would be is that it would correspond to changing the parameters of the theory. Um, and so, and so, we're very interested in seeing if, if this is really 